Right, let's start again. Um, I quoted last year the words of uh, quite a well-known Christian missionary and statesman, a man called Frank Laubach. And Frank Laubach prayed, Lord, forgive us for looking at your world with dry eyes. Forgive us for looking at your world with dry eyes. Now, if you're like me, then I imagine that you have found it much harder in the last 12 days or so to look at our world with dry eyes because of what is going on in Ukraine. And I don't want to uh, just sort of dismiss what is going on around us. It's, it's, we're constantly being reminded of that, this awful situation. So our prayers are going to be very much focused on uh, the people of uh, Ukraine and, and Russia and that part of the world. Um, Alan is going to lead those um, a bit later on. But, but I had intended, and I'm going to start a new series of teaching tonight, looking at Jesus and his message about the kingdom of God. And I think sometimes we, we re read Bible passages and we we hear sermons and we think, well, it's just about something else. But I want to suggest to you tonight that the message of Jesus and God's kingdom could never be more relevant than it is to us in our world today. Because Jesus lived in a world that had its own Putin. The Roman emperor was every bit as violent and cruel. He headed up a huge military machine that dominated and oppressed many, many peoples. And though he didn't have airplanes and cluster bombs, he had crosses and used them very, very effectively to destroy nations and to oppress people. So my prayer is that the message that God would bring to us tonight would be relevant and would help us not only to weep for the world as Jesus himself wept for the people of Jerusalem, knowing what would befall them as a result of violence but it would be just helpful in our, in our own lives. So the opening worship will come up on the screen, and I'm going to invite you to join in the, the responses, and then we'll sing our opening hymn. And so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. One thing I have asked of the Lord this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Who is it that you seek? We seek the Lord, our God. Do you seek him with all your heart? Amen. Lord, have mercy. Do you seek him with all your soul? Amen. Lord, have mercy. Do you seek him with all your mind? Amen. Lord, have mercy. And do you seek him with all your strength? Amen. Christ, have mercy. And then these next words, which you will perhaps recognize as coming from uh, one of the disciples we declare our faith by saying together, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Let's stand as we sing our opening hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Sit, please. And I invite you to join with me now in a prayer of confession. We pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to continue in our prayer. to focus our prayers on Ukraine. In sorrow and pain, we hold before you the situation unfolding in Ukraine. For those caught in the conflict, for those watching on in horror, for those relieving the trauma of their, reliving the trauma of their past, trusting in your goodness and love, Lord God, we cry out to you. Now we're going to have some responsive prayers. So I will say the first line and you will say, we cry out to you, O Lord. For those who flee, leaving homes and lives, we cry out to you, O Lord. For those who are gripped with terror and fear, we cry out to you, O Lord. 
for cities surrounded and under fire, we cry out to you, O Lord. For those who shelter in bathrooms and basements, we cry out to you, O Lord. For those who fear they must take, arm, uh, take up arms, for those that we cry out to you, O Lord. For civilians turning soldiers who fight for their homes, we cry out to you, O Lord. For those under orders they don't understand, we cry out to you, O Lord. For those who are wounded and killed in conflict, we cry out to you, O Lord. With those who mourn and those who weep, we cry out to you, O Lord. now we pray with the words of a Ukrainian songwriter, Andrei Reifel. I long for you as a baby longs for mother, as the dry land longs for the rain. I long for you. I look at you when I'm exhausted in the struggle. I pray to you because I believe my victory is in you. I stand on the word. This world cannot overcome your love. God of peace and justice, we pray your transforming love would be poured out on our troubled world. In hope and expectation, we pray your peace would come. Um, through the, sorry, through the, the work of negotiators and diplomats and politicians, and again, if you would respond as I pray. Through pro protests and petitions, we pray your peace would come. Through pressure and sanctions, we pray your peace would come. In city streets where violence rages, we pray your peace would come. In shattered homes and shelled sub suburbs, we pray your peace would come. In the hearts of those who wage war, we pray your peace would come. Where greed and pride drive our, our actions, we pray your peace would come. Where selfish ambition overrules love and compassion, we pray your peace would come. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children at risk and in fear that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And just uh, to add into those prayers, a slightly different uh, area, we pray for Susie Kearley. We thank you, Lord, that Susie has come home from hospital. Please continue to heal her. Just going to invite you to join with me in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. We say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. 
I'm going to suggest that we remain seated for this next song, that we treat it as a sort of meditation or a prayer. I think you will be able to identify with the words of the song where feet may fail. My faith will stand And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Above the waves, when 
The Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 30. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. News about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Is this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zareth in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Tim, for that uh, reading. Let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we need the help of your Holy Spirit as we look into your word. We pray that that word would come alive. We pray that we might see Jesus more clearly and that we might understand what you are calling us to be and to do for his name's sake. Amen. I'm going to let you into a secret. I haven't got Jesus and his message figured out. And I probably never will. Now, I realize that some of you may have already come to that conclusion listening to my sermons in the past. But seriously, the more I read the gospel narratives, the more I discover that Jesus is far more radical, far more disturbing. He's far more visionary and transformative. 
than I had ever imagined. In this message tonight and in the little series that's going to uh, follow, I want my heart to be captivated afresh by this Jesus and his message. I want to be open to new thoughts and possibilities. I want to immerse myself in his message so that I can see the world with all its challenges in fresh light. And so I want to be challenged by this Jesus so that I can be an agent of his kingdom and see this dark, broken world changed. But all that makes an assumption, and the assumption is that Jesus had a message that could change the world. Mahatma Gandhi certainly thought that he did. This is what he wrote. He said, you Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces. Turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it as though it was nothing more than a piece of literature. So how do we begin to describe Jesus? How do we explain the draw that so many feel towards the irreligious spirituality of this rabbi from Nazareth? Why are so many still fascinated by the person of Jesus, by his teaching and his life, even if they have turned away from that brand of religion that we call Christianity? Surely, he is more attractive, more exciting and scandalous than we realize. I don't want to settle for a religion that just makes honoring statements about Jesus and sings songs to Jesus, but somehow misses the radical treasures in his message about the kingdom of God. In the reading that we've just heard that Tim read from Luke chapter 4, Jesus is standing before his hometown of Nazareth. He knew everybody there, and they all knew him, or at least they thought that they did. But the word is out. Apparently, he's been healing people. He's been teaching in the synagogues with great authority. And now this son of Joseph is preaching before his home crowd. The text for the day is Isaiah 61, and he unrolls the scroll. He reads the passage. He rolls the scroll again, and he begins. Today. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And at first, it all seems to be going very well. But before long, they are ready to push him off a cliff. And that is quite a strong reaction to any sermon. I'm glad I'm not preaching this up in the tongue. Uh, it would be a bit riskier up there. But why? Why were these people so angry at the preaching of Jesus? I mean, he certainly grabbed their attention with his opening words. And we're told that they were amazed at his gracious words. And it sounds at first reading that they're just surprised that this son of someone from their own community should be such a, an able speaker. But I find myself wondering whether what it means is they were not amazed at his gracious words, but they were amazed at his words about grace. In other words, they were astonished that he was speaking about God's grace that was for everybody and not just for Jews. And I think that interpretation is supported by what Jesus goes on to say and by what actually happens. It's as though Jesus senses that they're not really catching, they're not getting his message, and so he, he taunts them. He says, oh, well, you're going to say to me, aren't you, physician, heal yourself. And then he brings up the whole idea of doing some sort of demonstration of power. Um, the, the challenge to put on a, a performance. Do here in your hometown 
what we heard you did in Capernaum. And then in defense of what he has been saying, he goes back into the Old Testament again and to the great prophets, Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, who was sent to help a widow, but not a Jewish one, and Elisha, who healed a solitary leper, who was a commander of the enemy army. Oh, that hurt. That's what made them so angry. This reminder that Israel's God was rescuing the wrong people. And I think it's quite reasonable to assume that in the earlier part of his message, Jesus was hammering home the same point, that it was not grace for Israel and fierce judgment for all the other nations, but rather it was grace for everyone, including the nations. And doesn't that make you wonder? What if the Christian church understood, believed, and lived that message? What if we were increasingly faithful to what Jesus actually taught? Might that not bring hope to our troubled world? We, we live in an age of increasing religious conflict. But Muslims regard Jesus as a prophet. Many Hindus consider Jesus as a manifestation of the divine. Many Buddhists see Jesus as one of humanity's most enlightened. And the Jews? Well, Jesus was a Jew. Now, I know that some of us are very wary of anything that is interfaith. And I don't want to compromise our understanding of Jesus as the unique son of God. I've been preaching about that for, for several weeks now. But that doesn't mean that as Christians we have to be divisive or aggressive or combative. It doesn't mean that we can't look for common ground. Is there not the possibility that a shared reappraisal of the could provide a unique space for the religious dialogue that our world so desperately needs. It was reading the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, night after night, that led and kept Gandhi on that, uh, that non-violence path that he took. But let's for a moment go back to the synagogue in Nazareth. Jesus began with a quotation from Isaiah because it was all about the Messiah. And in the prophecy of Isaiah, we meet this lonely, uh, strange and, and anointed uh, figure of the Messiah. We meet him several uh, times. Someone who will come and perform the Lord's will. And the passage that he read actually goes on in the next few verses to talk about the day of God's vengeance. But it seems that Jesus deliberately stops before that because he's drawing a much bigger picture of Israel as a light to the nations. The suffering servant has not come to inflict punishment on the nations but to bring God's love and mercy to all. And that message was shocking. It was not what first century Jews wanted or expected. But that is what the gospel does. It challenges our preconceived ideas and our agendas. And we have to ask ourselves whether we are open to be challenged afresh by the message of Jesus. So what if Jesus never came to start a new religion, but rather he came to start a political, social, religious, economic, intellectual and spiritual revolution that would give birth to a new world? What if Jesus' message had practical implications for how you live your daily life, how you earn and spend your money, how you treat people of other races and religions, and how nations conduct their foreign policy? What if 
Jesus' message impacted issues like advertising, the environment, terrorism, economics, sexuality, marriage, parenting, and the search for happiness and peace. Jesus' message is good news, not only for Christians, but also for Jews and Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims, New Agers, agnostics, and atheists. I confess that as someone who's been in Christian ministry for a very, very long time, that for so many of those years, I missed the centrality of Jesus' message about his kingdom. The focus of Christian ministry and mission was simply getting people into heaven. Our focus was not on this life and this world, but that is clearly where Jesus' focus was. He began his ministry by saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom was now present. It had arrived in the person and the ministry of Jesus. And in his signs and his miracles, he was enacting the arrival of that kingdom. He was helping us glimpse what that kingdom would look like. He saw someone who was sick and he healed them. I don't want sickness in my kingdom. He saw someone who was afflicted by a spirit. He said, I don't want that in my kingdom. And he drove it out on several occasions. He confronted death and said, not in my kingdom. He gave us a picture of what his kingdom will be like. So he said, the kingdom is at hand, it's arrived. But he also taught that the kingdom of God was near. Almost as though history is pregnant with the kingdom hasn't quite arrived yet, but he says even within a generation, more would be fulfilled. And then he taught us about the delay in the coming of the kingdom. That's why he encouraged us to pray as we've done tonight. Thy kingdom come. There is no more significant, important prayer that is the center of our prayer life. Your kingdom come. And finally, he said the kingdom would come in the future at the apocalyptic end to all history. And so Jesus taught that the kingdom of God is simultaneously here, near, delayed, and future. And it's in Jesus that we begin to experience the presence of the future. It's through his ministry, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and through the release of the, the, the Spirit's power at Pentecost that the powers of the age are breaking into the present. You see, for, for our friends who, who do not yet believe, life is relatively simple. They just live in this present world. But for those of us who, who do believe, who do seek to, to follow Jesus, it's a bit more complicated because we find ourselves living in an overlap, an overlap of two ages, of, of two kingdoms. It's how we experience the Christian life, living where these two kingdoms coexist, each of them competing for supremacy in our hearts. And I believe that that is one of the focuses of of, of this season of, of Lent, when through a variety of spiritual disciplines we seek to, to live more intentionally in the kingdom of God rather than in the kingdom of this world. So I ask you, is the kingdom of God already? And the answer is, it's yes, it's yes. The kingdom has arrived, and we do see signs of it. But is the kingdom not yet? And of course, the answer is also yes. And that means that if we're followers of Jesus, we are ourselves already and not yet people. I said to the folk down at All Saints this morning, I said, look around. 
We are a strange bunch of beings. But this is important if we're going to understand ourselves and our life because we are already, not yet, delayed future people. You see, we are already loved by God. We're already adopted into his family. We're already reconciled new creations. That's what the scriptures teach us. Amen? Two and a half. But we are not yet. We're waiting and we're praying for God to move. We long for more. And we are delayed. We, we realize that God isn't always in the same kind of hurry that we're in. And so we go on praying. And some of us know what that's like. We have prayed perhaps for decades for somebody longing that they would open their hearts to God. And then future. We know that one day, we are going to be completely transformed when we see Jesus return and bring in the new heaven and the new earth. And the amazing privilege that is ours is that God invites us to partner with him in making more of the future a reality now. To make more of the future a reality now. Thy kingdom come. And we do that when we pick up a piece of litter. We do that when we comfort someone who is mourning. When we visit someone who is sick. When we befriend someone who is an outsider. When we demonstrate the love and the acceptance and the grace of God. We are bringing the future forward into our world. We partner with God. That is our privilege. And that's, I believe, his invitation to us tonight. So let's pray. Father, you know our hearts. You know where we are in our spiritual journeys. We're all in, in different places. But wherever we are on that journey... Lord, we pray that we might be inspired, that we might be moved and challenged, that we might be shocked and motivated by Jesus and his message of the kingdom. And I pray that in, even in this coming week, you would give each of us eyes to see and the grace to seize opportunities to make more of the future a reality now. And so we pray, Lord, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Amen. Well, we're going to sing as our final, final hymn, uh, an old favorite, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Let's stand as we sing. Thank you. No. 
And now may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm, and may he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you all now and evermore. Amen. Just a reminder that we've got refreshments, so I hope you will stay and, and chat. Thank you.